we remember 9-11. And emotional, psychic, and spiritual preparation for this 10th anniversary and for my reflections this evening with you, I spent some hard time perusing the internet to see what was there and to see what people were saying of our land in the days approaching this 10th anniversary. A simple Google search will reveal images that we know are there but do not lose their power. The planes going into the buildings. Horrific images of people jumping from heights that are not survivable. And then the eerie collapse of first one and then another tower. In a period of less than two hours, over 3,000 people died. As we well know, many of those who did perish did so because they rough, rushed into the inferno to save others. And then there were others who, who died trying to avert a fourth airplane becoming a human missile. We remember 9-11. Memory. Memory has enormous power. As a child growing up in Texas, we were indoctrinated into the history of the Lone Star State. We all learned the story of the Alamo, Goliad, and Santa Ana's treachery in those places. We also learned how the victorious troops under Sam Houston, as they attacked at San Jacinto, shouted, Remember the Alamo, remember Goliad. And half a century later, Teddy Roosevelt leads his troops of San Juan Hill in the Spanish American War, and their cry is, Remember the Maine. And then, boys crossing the Pacific Island hopping with General MacArthur. They remember Pearl Harbor. And now, our warrior yell, remember 9-11. The sons and daughters walk the villages and poppy fields of Afghanistan and drive their Humvees across the deserts of Iraq. As a nation, our fearful memory evokes the battle. Never again. So we go to war. We began, of course, by hunting down bin Laden, Al Qaeda, the Taliban, those responsible. But then we proceeded with the prison at one time. We accepted much collateral damage. An antiseptic term that encompasses so much tragedy, pain, and death. As we all know, after two years, fanned by fear, we found another villain, one we could see, Saddam Hussein, the perfect candidate, because he really was an evil man who had done so much harm. And the tanks rolled. And there was more collateral damage. One of the things I remember about the days immediately after 9 11 was the great outpouring of grief, concern, and sympathy for the people of the United States. Just as, as in our country, Norwegian flags seem omnipresent after a madman's summer slaughter, so too did the world reach out to us. <coughs> Here's an excerpt from an article written on September 12, 2001, in Paris's Le Mans. It's emblematic. In this tragic moment, when 
words seem so inadequate to express the shock people feel, the first thing that comes to mind is this. We are all Americans. We are all New Yorkers. Just as surely as John F. Kennedy declared himself to be a Berliner in 1962 when he visited Berlin. Indeed, just as in the greatest moments of our own history, how can we not feel profound solidarity with the people of that country, the United States, to whom we are so close and to whom we owe our freedom and therefore our solidarity? As we are aware, that poetic sentiment did not last. Over 100,000 Iraqi and 40,000 Afghani citizens, civilians, killed, contributed to this erosion of goodwill. And so this we must do. As we remember our loss, as we remember those who died on our shores, we cannot grieve those killed by terrorists without also grieving all the other innocents who died as a result of our nation's response. And we must also remember those in our service, in the service of other nations, who found their lives tragically ended. On this day of remembering, we cannot have selective memory. In the days and years that followed 9-11, our nation has had several moments of choices. In his book, The Assault on Reason, Al Gore writes this, that nations succeed or fail and define their essential character by the way they are challenged by the unknown and cope with fear. Indeed, our manner of coping and our overarching response to the challenge of 9-11 was to meet violence with violence and a disquieting tendency to compromise our standard of human rights as well as our own civil rights. As Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, hate begets hate, violence begets violence, toughness begets toughness. We must meet the forces of hate with the power of love. This power of love is our inheritance. Words that we heard from an 8th century Judean prophet, Micah, give us that vision. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. I am aware that San Diego is essentially a military town. Many of you have served in our nation's armed services, and some of you were on active duty. And we rightly honor those who on this night are in harm's way. I think it is safe to say that every Marine, every sailor, every soldier prays for God's vision, vision of Shalom, of a peaceful kingdom come, where they will learn war no more. And so our days in the prophecy of Micah might be paraphrased to something like this. They'll turn their Apache helicopters into schools, and they'll transform their Tomahawk missiles into medical clinics, and war will be obsolete. Wouldn't it be wonderful 
saved and that mission accomplished. And that is the mission. That is the mission that we have been given by Jesus. To be lovers of friends and enemies. To turn the other cheek. To be able to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they were doing. For blessed are the peacemakers. Well, now ten years have passed. I certainly pray we're a bit smarter. Sodom and Osama are dead and gone. Soldiers and civilians continue to die. A second president seems helplessly trapped in war. And as a nation, and as a church, we remain strangely silent as a small percentage of our citizens pay a huge price for what is happening. God's vision and dream of Shalom is our charge. As those who follow the Prince of Peace, this is how we honor the innocent and the heroes of the 9-11 and the days after. Is how we honor those who literally soldier on. But how do we do this as individuals? Well, we certainly remember it's important to remember. It's also important to pray for peace. But we also have to act. We have to give peace. And the moments of giving peace are extraordinarily personal. And they come at us when we least expect it. This, this past week, like many of you, I have found in NPR my general driving companion to be a helpful way to look at what has been happening. And I trust others of you may have caught the segment that I did about September 10th, the day before everything changed. We can't go back to that world, but one man's story struck me as an example of giving peace. Simple, yet beautiful, in a way to meet the world after 9-11. The man's name is Ron Quinlan. He was from Omaha, Nebraska, and a software salesman was taking a flight to New York City for an annual sales meeting. And when he was on the flight, he sat down next to Ann the man asked him if he worked for, for NASCAR, and he didn't realize why at first, except that he had a NASCAR t-shirt on. He said, oh no, I was a big fan of Jeff Gordon. That was the conversation starter. It turns out that this man's 15-year-old son, who had epilepsy, was also a big NASCAR fan. The man said, I'm traveling a lot, son, and you know, we and I will take a trip sometime soon. Uh, he said, let's, let's do that. If you can, if you had only one thing left to live somewhere, where would you want to go? What would you want to do? And he said, well, I'd like to go to an NASCAR race and meet Jeff Gordon. And Quinlan says that it, they talked a bit more, and he said, well, you know, I can make that happen. I got some extra tickets to race in Kansas Speedway. And he offered them to the man. And so they exchanged business cards. He went to the business card, it was a United Airlines card, and it was Captain J.C. Dahl. Captain Jay Seagal was deadheaded to Newark, so the next day he could take the flight 93, the flight that crashed in the field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. He didn't get the chance to take his son to meet Jeff Gordon. But here's the peace thing. Here is the act of love. When sure that Jeff's son, that Jason's son, did. We'll never know when we're going to have such an encounter as he did. We'll never know those moments when something profound can happen, when we, in our own little way, can take the dark world and make it brighter, when we can light the flame which will change that corner of the universe. But as we remember, can be prepared for such moments. We can be looking for them. Moments of grace and hope. 
as they come to us. We can be peacemakers and hope givers and bearers of light. One flicker of an eternal flame of holy memory and peaceable action. In another time, when dark clouds descended upon Europe, W.A. Jordan took pen and paper and wrote a poem entitled September 1, 1939, the day that the Nazi army and Air Force attacked Poland. He wrote, Defenseless under the night, our world in super lies, yet dotted everywhere ironic points of light, flash out wherever the just exchange their messages. May I compose like them of eros and of dust, believed by the same negation and despair, show an affirming flame. In the flickering candles of the ending day, ten years later, the time of remembering, let us depart this sanctuary and show forth such an affirming.